So for this video, we're going to be talking about this beauty, Messier 99. It's a gorgeous face-on spiral galaxy. You can see that it's got multiple spiral arms, but they're not very symmetrical. You've got one out here, and then you've got this one, which is shorter, uh, bifurcates a little bit, and the nucleus seems to be offset. That's a real good indication that something is going on to disturb this galaxy. That wouldn't at all be a surprise because this is a member of the Virgo cluster, as many of the other messy objects that are galaxies are. It's in a very complex environment. In fact, it's moving away from us at a very high recession velocity, and it's probably traveling through the Virgo cluster at about 1200 kilometers per second. And so in doing so, it's probably having some of its material removed. It's definitely interacting or has interacted in the past gravitationally with some other nearby object to produce this asymmetry in its spiral arms. It's not a starburst, but it's forming stars at about three times the normal rate. So all of this interaction is doing things to its gas content that's making it produce stars. But while all this interests me, that's not actually what I'm going to talk about today. I'm going to talk about a very odd, mysterious object that's appeared within the galaxy. A few years back, there was an astronomical telegram released, which is the, the old-fashioned but actually quite modern electronic way of announcing, hey, we found something to the astronomical community. And so in this galaxy, astronomers announced the discovery of a transient object in one of the spiral arms. This is what the discovery image looked like. This is from the Palomar Transit Factory, which was a fully automated system to survey large patches of the sky over and over again at a regular cadence and then look at the difference between the two electronic images. If nothing had changed, then the difference image between the two would be just blank. But if something was not there in one, in one image and there in the next frame, taking those, the difference between those two would show something come up, which can be automatically determined. And so the object that was discovered in M99 is marked by the crosshatch here. So it doesn't look like much, but it turns out to be quite an interesting object. Now, the standard operating procedure for these large-scale transient surveys is when they uncover objects, as they're doing at a reg on a regular basis because of the nature of the survey, they then request target of opportunity observations on other telescopes to follow them up. And that just means they get to jump the queue because this object might be fading rapidly in time. And so here's a spectrum of that object taken just two days after its discovery. And so this was a target of opportunity observation from the Gemini telescope. And the black line shows the spectrum. And here's where things start to get interesting because the luminosity of this object, its brightness, showed that it was sort of an in-between class of object. Not quite sure which camp it fell in. So there's multiple ways that you can have a transient object. You could have a star that is just regularly pulsating. You could have a moving solar system object. You could have an active galactic nucleus that's varying on timescales of days, weeks, months. Or you could have some sort of stellar explosion. And one kind of stellar explosion that we know of is called a nova. And that just means a new star. People have been able to see new objects appear with the naked eye for thousands of years. And so that was the catch-all term for them. New star, nova. There's also a class of objects called supernova which also means new star, but a much, much brighter kind of star. Physically, those are two very different objects. So the nova, we think, are non-terminal phenomena. That means that there's something happening to a star that's causing a flare. Normally, we think it's the interaction between two binary stars, and a supernova is the end of a star's lifetime. And one way that you can have that happen is core collapse from an, a massive star where the fusion in the center is no longer enough to counterbalance the gravitational collapse. So pressure and gravity aren't balanced, the star collapses and then explodes and expels most, if not all, of the material away. But the mystery of this object and a handful of other objects that were discovered around the same time is that it doesn't fall into either of these classes. And so it's brighter than a nova, but not as bright as a supernova. And so in, in logical astronomical terms, it's an intermediate nova. It's very red. Looking at 
um, observations with the Hubble Space Telescope from before the discovery. There's no progenitor to be seen, although subsequently an HST image shows a very red object at that location. And the light curve, how the brightness changes over time, was such that it was about 100 or 130 days for this thing to, to fade away. So this starts to raise interesting questions. Well, what could this thing be? Um, and I'm not sure that we know enough to speculate, but it's obviously some sort of energetic event. Could be the merger of two stars or even the merger of a planet into the atmosphere of another star. There are multiple other possibilities, but at the moment, they're all just speculation. But on the horizon is a real game changer. And so coming up in the next few years is the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope, or LSST. And this is a telescope that is designed from the ground up to be able to work very quickly to cover huge patches of the sky multiple times every night, taking many, many images that can be used for all sorts of astronomical purposes, but in particular to look for transient objects. The data rate from this telescope is going to be phenomenal. Astronomers are gearing up already in, in, in how to handle this fire hose of this data stream that's going to come out of this. But what you can see from the other side is that this is going to open up new doors new areas of parameter space that we haven't looked at before. Then you go from a handful of objects to thousands of objects, tens of thousands of objects. And then you start to be able to do statistics. And once you can do statistics, you can get a grip on the astrophysics behind whether these objects are all from the same type of object or whether they're just different examples of multiple different classes of interesting but rare objects that we simply haven't observed the sky often enough to be able to find. The LSST is currently under construction as we film this on a large mountaintop in Chile. And the plan is that it will see science first light in 2021 and then commence a 10 year survey in 2022. And what's interesting about this survey is that the data are going to be immediately made public. We're entering such a data rich era of astronomy and there's more than enough out there to be discovered. So I think it's only a good thing that the data is shared and that um, people have access to it. They should come across like this, navigating carefully and slowly to get through the narrows. However, that's not what happened. If this is what we think it might be. This is him rewriting history, rewriting what he said the first time. Well, just, 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 you know, redrafting in it such a way that it would be acceptable to his contemporaries.